Ladies and gentlemen, I uh, welcome you to my presentation, the design of a steel lattice transmission tower in Central Europe. This task has been part of the European funded research project Angel High, which was funded by the European Commission under the Research Fund for Coal and Steel. On top, you could see the different partners um, participating in the project. We have the National Technical University of Athens in Greece, ArcelorMittal in Luxembourg, the University of Liège in Belgium, Cosmote in Greece, CTCM in France and SICA also located in France. And my uh, partner, uh, Professor Ioannis Vayas, will also present to you uh, the generalities of the project Angel High in a specific presentation. So what was the objective of my task, this design? It was, first of all, to identify a typical typology for transmission towers in Europe and on the typical topology to carry out the design of this one single tower according to the standard EN 50341. And this will later be, this design will later be compared to uh, possible designs according to Eurocode 3 part 11 and Eurocode 331 and also a nonlinear uh, design. The objective of this is to highlight and to work out the contradiction that exists when you have the possibility to design the steel lattice towers according to different standards, because in the different standards we will have different rules for uh, the uh, design, so there is a lack of harmonization. And uh, further on, the case study will serve as a basis for further research within the project Angel High. Here we see some typical tower topologies that we identified. So we have on the left the Danube Tower, in the middle the Barrel Tower, and on the right the Single Span Tower. The main differences of these towers are the height, so for the Danube Tower between 30 and 50 meters, and a width of 30 meter. The Barrel Tower is slightly higher, with a height between 50 and 60 meter, but also a little bit smaller, taller, so the width is 20 meters. And then the Single Span Tower on the right, which has a height of only 30 and 40 meters, uh, but with a width of 40 meters. The different towers are used in different landscapes. For example, the Danube Tower is a good rounder to be used in woods, urban areas. And uh, the Barrel Tower is mainly used also in woods because you have a height, so with certain distance between the conductors and the trees to cross rivers and also in farms to protect the animals living on the farm uh, from the conductors. And then on the right for the single, single span tower with a reduced height, it is quite useful in areas for, uh, um, uh, for airports uh, where you will not disturb uh, the air traffic with a limited height. But of course it's a little bit wider, meaning also a deeper impact on uh, the environmental, uh, on the environment, because uh, you need these protection strips on the left and on the right of the tower. And what we identified as the most typical tower typology in Europe, in Central Europe at least, was the Danube Tower. And so we selected this for the case study. And here you could see that we also carried out a design for both types of towers. We have suspension towers, which are towers with only hanging insulators that you could see on the left. So uh, they will transfer only the self-weight and ice loads acting on the conductors, as well as the self-weight of the tower body and the trans transverse wind loads. So traction or forces or tension forces from the conductors will not be transferred to the tower structure. Therefore, we will end up with a lighter structure in general. The application is to support just simply the conductors and to limit the span within a transmission line. Then the dead end tower, uh, which is uh, which has a characterized via horizontal strain insulators. So meaning here we transfer the tension loads acting in the conductors to the tower structure in addition to the self weight of the tower body and in addition to the self weight and ice loads of the conductors. And also the transverse and longitudinal wind loads will be transferred to the tower. So compared to the suspension tower, who will normally have a heavier structure. The applications are normally each time when there's a change of a line direction, because here we have to transfer tension forces to the tower. At the end of the lines where we have 
uh, a change from overhead lines to buried cables. And also uh, for redundancy reasons, normally each third or fourth tower in a line is such a dead end tower, uh, just to avoid any casket failure within the line and to ensure uh, the safety of the infrastructure. Then for the case study, we assumed that this tower, the the Danube Tower is located in the Erzgebirge in Germany, so in a mountain area in wind zone 2 and ice zone 2 with a height below 750 meters. Here we could see the layout of the transmission line, so we have for the suspension tower a straight line with elevation differences between the towers, and for the dead-end tower we have an inclined line, as you can see on the left picture, with an angle of 22.5 degrees to the horizontal, and with uh, elevation differences uh, also between the towers. The spans can be seen uh, on the right picture, we have a tower span of 250 meter each, and the wind span, which is, corresponds to the tower span of 250 meter, and a weight span of 525 meters, and the weight span is defined as the distance between the two lowest part of the conductors in two adjacent spans that you could uh, see here. Then uh, concerning the general information of the tower, so we designed a suspension tower and a dead end tower. We had two circuits of 380 kilovolt. Each circuit uh, buries uh, three faces on each side of uh, the tower. The conductors can be seen here, they are specified, so meaning it is a steel core in the middle of the conductor to stabilize the conductor and with an aluminium um, envelope uh, to ensure uh, the flow of the current. And for the earth wire, we only have one cable on top of the tower uh, to protect it against uh, thunderstorms and uh, the insulators were the quadricil insulators from the company Hubble with a length of five meters, which is a typical insulation length for the voltage of 380 kilo. Here you could see the general um, design of or layout of the tower. It's a standardized tower with a height of 50.2 meters, a total width, so the width of the longest cross arms of 31 meter, and uh, the basement is a squared section with a length of 6.84 meters. Now the design assumptions, the, design, the towers have been uh, designed in the software tower version 15 from uh, the Powerline uh, systems. The load and the design were uh, uh, carried out according to EN 50341 part 24, which is a German national annex of the standard. And this was implemented in the code, so it, uh, in, the, in, the, in the software, sorry. So it was quite easy to carry out this design. We only consider one single tower design, so not the total line, transmission line, but only one single uh, insulated tower. The conductors have uh, not been modeled, so uh, the point loads uh, were applied coming from the self-weight and the wind acting on the insulators were directly applied on the insulators of the tower. It was a linear elastic design. The connection as well as the foundation were not designed and we only used one uh, single angle profiles, hot rod profiles, which are the standard profiles for such type of structure. The general design assumptions are a linear elastic design and first order theory as prescribed by the standard. The tower is considered as a pin jointed truss structure and I compose it of trusses and beam elements. The beam elements are necessary to avoid uh, the out of plane movement of nodes in the numerical model. The foundation were just considered as pin supports. The eccentricities in the connection between the legs and the diagonals were considered via non-dimensional slenderness factor lambda effective, which is defined in the Annex G4 of EN 50,241, and uh, only axial and, tension, and compression forces are acting in the truss elements. And uh, we have to use buckling curve C according to Annex G of the standard for stability checks. The wind loads were calculated according to method one, meaning that the tower has been subdivided into several segments and uh, that the wind acts on each segment and then will be transferred to the nodes of each of the segments. This method is uh, described in detail in EN 50,241. 
Then the wind and ice loads on the insulators has been considered, but the ice loads or ice load accumulation on the tower structure itself has not been considered because it is explicitly written in the standard that you can uh, neglect this ice accumulation on the tower itself. The ice load on the conductors have been calculated by the German Net Meteorological Services and long time experiences, and they were reflected in the ice zone two that we selected. For the dead end tower, we also calculated the tension forces coming from sex temperature ice loads by an Excel sheet, and uh, then we applied this as a point load on the insulators. The steel grid that has been selected was steel grid S355G2 according to the product standard 10. 25, uh, 10,025 part 2, and also a higher strength steel S460 according to the product standard EN 10,025 part 4 for thermomechanically rolled. Then the general assumption in the numerical model, so only primary and, brace and secondary bracing systems have also been considered. So the connection as well as the foundations have not been modeled. We use truss elements, which you can see in blue on the right picture. And uh, then we have beam elements in green. We did not model the conductor, uh, the conductor, sorry, as I already told you. And the tower has been divided into two section and two cross arms only single angles has been used and uh, the self weight is calculated automatically by the tower and we add added uh, additional 20 percent to take into account the self weight of uh, the gusset plates and bolts for the connection the wind loads on the tower have been calculated automatically by tower according to the method one described in EN 50,241. The wind and ice loads on the conductors have been calculated by hand, also according to the method in the standard 50,241. The ice load on the insulators, the same, calculated by hand. The, wide, uh, the weight of the line man, so for maintenance reasons, sometimes there will be people working on the line, so they will uh, mount uh, the tower and you have to consider their weight. And this is calculated automatically by tower according to the standard. The construction loads has been calculated by hand and the load combinations have been considered according to the EN 50,241. Here you could see in different colors a different segment of the towers. And here you could see the different load cases. So we have 12 load cases from A to L. Load cases A to C are the wind loads coming from the three main direction X, Y, and in an inclined plane of 45 degrees to the tower. We have extreme ice loads combined with the wind for the load cases D to F. And we have construction and maintenance loads in load case E. Load case G to L are exceptional load like unbalanced ice loads, meaning ice loads on, in the conduct, on the conductors in one span and no ice loads on the other span. Then for the suspension tower, uh, the load cases A to G are sufficient. The weight of the light mans applied uh, were applied on members which has an inclination of less than 30 degree to the horizontal. And this has been considered by a point load of one kilonewton in the center of the member. In addition, you can see here the different uh, safety factors that you have to apply for the different load cases according to the standard EN 50,341. Then the design checks that has been carried out, there we have carried out only a verification in the ultimate limit state, so no verification in the service limit state and no fatigue um, verification, but it is also explicitly written in the standard that you do not need to consider any fatigue loading. Then uh, for the section verification, we did the tension and compression checks according to Annex G of the standard. For the member verification, we did the flexural and flexural torsional buckling according to Annex G. The crossing diagonal check for bracing without secondary bracing has, already, has also been carried out. And we did the verification of the bracing inclination show proving that no member has an inclination of less than 45 degrees to the horizontal, at least for the bracing elements. Then for the redundant member verification uh, was also done by assuming an hypothetical transversal force of 2% of the extra forces in the uh, members to be braced has been applied in the braced members, in fact. And then the verification for alignments for the members, as I already explained, for members with an inclination of less than 30 degrees. 
Then we have here uh, the results of uh, the study. So we did an automatic optimization uh, by uh, tower. So uh, uh, the angle sizes as well as the angle type has been automatically selected by the software tower in order to achieve the lightest structure with the highest utilization degree. And the results can be seen here for the suspension tower in S355. We can see that we have a total weight of nearly 17 uh, tons. Then for the dead-end towers in S355, which is quite heavier, as I explained to you at the beginning of my presentation, so with a total weight of 66 tons, so much higher. But there is a chance to reduce this weight by using high-strength steel S460. So here it is a small error in the presentation because it is a dead-end tower not in S355 but in S460. And here we can see that the tonnage is reduced from 66 to 56 tons by replacing uh, uh, the leg members and the main uh, members of the cross arms uh, by S460M steel. And uh, this was what I would like uh, to present you during this conference. I thank you very much uh, for uh, your attention. And uh, now if you have some questions, unfortunately I cannot participate in the live, but I think one of my colleagues uh, will be so friendly to uh, reply to all your questions. Thank you very much.